Hello, my name is Glenn Andrea. I'm a filmmaker and film historian. And today we're going to be talking about the great Lucille Ball. And what I'm going to focus on is her career up until the time she made the very popular TV show, I Love Lucy. And we'll be talking about how she worked with different comedians, different directors, technicians. So she really sharpened her skills as a comedian and as an expert television producer. Lucille Ball was born on August 6, 1911, in Jamestown, New York. And she got the acting, performing bug very early on. When her mom would take her grocery shopping to, like, let's say, a general store, uh, she would be in the aisles performing and dancing and fooling around. So she would do some amateur theater. Lucy's father died when she was very young. So her and her mother went to move in with her grandfather, who also lived in Jamestown. And she would get jobs at, let's say, working at a hamburger stand. And you'd see the future Lucy Ricardo uh, come out. She would be at the hamburger stand, and she would see people going by, and she'd say, Hey, you, over there, watch where you're going. Don't walk over there. Walk over here and have a delicious hamburger. So, tragedy that hit when Lucy was 15 years old. Uh, she lived next door to a kid named Warner Erickson. Now, Warner Erickson lived with his very tyrannical mom here. And Lucy and her family lived in the house here. And over here was some, like, woods or something where Warner liked to, uh, you know, play around. And, like I said, Warner had this very strict mother who would... You know, always, like, spank him on the front porch so everybody could see how she's handling her child. So one day, Warner's playing in the yard over here, and the mother is screaming, Warner, get here this instance. So Warner, with total fear, comes running across the ball's backyard. At the same time, uh, the ball, you know, Lucy and her family, they're... Um, doing target practice with a shotgun. So they don't see Warner come running across. They fire. Warner gets hit. He's crippled for life. And the mother sues the Ball family. She gets the house and all the furnishings. So ever since then, uh, Lucille Ball had this fear of the legal system, and she really had a fear of guns. Lucy's now 17 years old. And she moves to New York City to pursue a job as a model and as an actress. You know, money's very tight in the city, so uh, Lucille's real keeping to, you know, her integrity. She's not going to sell herself out. For instance, if she only had four pennies for the subway, she would uh, ask people for that extra penny so she can ride the subway. Subways then, at that time, cost a nickel. So there would always be some guy who'd come over and say, I'll, I'll give you more than a penny. Here's a $100 bill. Come with me. So she would just say, listen, I don't need to go with you. I don't need your $100. I just need a penny. I just need to get on the subway. She's getting uh, different jobs, modeling coats. And uh, she's spotted by the Samuel Goldwyn uh, people. Uh, they're producing a new Eddie Cantor film. Now, if you ever see an Eddie Cantor film from this Goldwyn period... He always has the Goldwyn girls, these beautiful models that just line up. She gets a job working on the next Eddie Cantor film, Roman Scandals, which is a kind of a spoof of ancient Rome. So anyway, uh, she signs a contract with the Goldwyn studio, and out she goes to Hollywood. When they get to Hollywood, Eddie Cantor has all the, uh, the dancing girls, all the models, all lined up, and he's going to choose which model and which dancing girl is going to be in his film. So what Lucy does is that she takes some red crepe paper, she wets it and puts it all over her face like she's got the measles or something. So you have Eddie Cantor seeing all these girls lined up and you know they're showing off their figure and et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden here's this girl with like this make-believe measles and Eddie Cantor just cracks up laughing and he says, we gotta put her in the movie. So in this rather risque Busby Berkeley dance number, there's our first glance of Lucille Ball. The first film Lucille Ball would have with a speaking role is in a now very hard-to-find 
gangster film called Blood Money. It's a really interesting movie starring George Bancroft as a uh, crooked bail bondsman. I apologize for the poor quality of the print. Blood Money is very hard to get a hold of. I wonder what this guy's reckoning is. What do you care? He promised us $5, didn't he? Who is he? He's awfully attractive, isn't he? You don't want to have anything to do with that guy. That's jewelry, the bank robber. She would have various bit parts in other films done at other studios, such as uh, Murder at the Vanities, uh, Made at Paramount, or The Whole Town's Talking over at Columbia. She signs up with RKO Studios, and she appears in a Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers uh, film, Roberta. And then she has an appearance in Top Hat, which is probably the most famous of the Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers films. Just charge it to Horace Hardwick, room 404. She was supposed to have the male part, where she'd be talking to Fred Astaire, but she kept on flubbing her line, so director Mark Sandrich uh, gave her the other part, the lesser part. I wonder what Mr. Bedini is going to say about this. Well, what can he say? Well, he's been sending her flowers daily ever since they came here. She's now able to buy a house in Los Angeles, and she moves her grandfather from Jamestown to Los Angeles to live with her. And he would be holding these uh, anti-capitalist meetings in their garage while she's at work. Uh, you know, you know, of course, he doesn't like the uh, whole capitalist system since he became bankrupt. Her next major appearance would be in Stage Door. It's a wonderful comedy drama uh, based on a stage play by Edna Ferber and George Kaufman. Here she is with uh, comic actor Grady Sutton. It's 1938, and the Marx Brothers do a film for RKO called Room Service. It's the first film that the Marx Brothers would do that's not especially written for them. It's based on a previous stage play. Lucille Ball is playing a secretary for near-bankrupt producer Groucho Marx. She didn't really like the uh, on-set lewd behavior the Marx Brothers took part in. I'll fire that waiter. I'll fire the whole darn kitchen. Quiet, please. There's a patient in the room. Mr. Davis has a tape on him. Last night it was the measles. I'm not responsible for complications. He's got laryngitis, too. As you can see here, room service, which is not very well liked amongst Marx I Brothers fans, that. it's a pretty funny movie. It's not what the Marx Brothers fans expected. Now, RKO Studios is trying out this Lucille Ball, so they give her a starring role in a uh, B comedy called The Affairs of Annabelle. She plays this very diva-ish uh, rising movie star named Annabelle, and her manager, played by Jack Oakey, is always trying to think of crazy publicity stunts. So in, in, early on in the film, he has her go to jail because they're going to be doing a prison film very soon. The next year, 1939, she would do one of her finest films at RKO, The Very Suspenseful Five Came Back. And it's pretty much the granddaddy of disaster films. There's this small plane that crashes in the uh, Mexican jungle. Everybody who survives the plane crash, which includes Lucille Ball, uh, have to do their best until they're rescued. She has excellent support by uh, such character actors as C. Audrey Smith, John Carradine, Chester Morris, who was flirting with Lucy on the set, and in the scene here, Alan Jenkins. Oh, Pete. And it's really Joseph Kalia who plays a revolutionary uh, about to be executed. He really steals the film. Dorothy Asner, the only real uh, female film director in classic Hollywood, uh, directed Lucille Ball in her next film, Dance Girl Dance, a terrific backstage drama. Here a troupe of dancers are vying for a job at a local burlesque house. And Lucille Ball just tops all of her uh, fellow dancers by doing this dance routine. Now Dorothy Asner, a very gifted director, would turn this from being just a typical girly show to comedy just with these reaction shots. Look at Maria Ospinskaya behind uh, lecherous Harold Huber. Now of course fights break out amongst the girls and uh, they all have to go to night court to settle the fight. RKO is preparing another film called Too Many Girls 
And one of the co-stars of the film was a young uh, Cuban drummer named Desi Arnaz. Desi Arnaz would visit the Dance Girl Dance set uh, just to get acquainted with some of the stars, including Lucille Ball, who's in Too Many Girls. The first time he really sees his future wife, she's all made up with, like, black eye and bruises. Judge, look at my eye. Look at my leg. Look where she slapped me on the back. <laughs> Desi Arnaz came from Cuba, and he grew up in a, in a very wealthy household. But then when the Batista Revolution came along, just with a shirt on his back, him and his family had to flee Cuba and go to Florida. So it's pretty much a riches to rag story. They start dating. Now what happens is that Desi would come over to the house to pick her up for a date. And as she's getting ready, the grandfather pulls Desi along and starts preaching from uh, newspapers like Pravda and The Daily Worker, trying to make Desi into a communist. The next year, Lucille Ball would be making The Big Street, a more drama than comedy Damon Runyon story about a uh, showgirl in New York City uh, who uh, has to go down to Florida because of an illness. Now, when I say Damon Runyon, Runyon always had stories that took place around Broadway and had all these like these weird sort of uh, grifters and weird characters that would populate his story. And in the big street, there's this smitten waiter played by Henry Fonda. Lucille Ball is a very vicious person. It's very much unlike Lucy Ricardo. What'd you bring these guys in here for? They were dying to see you, your We've brought your presents. We really came to see how the steeds do a tropical, but we don't forget old acquaintances. Well, you can start forgetting right now. This is a class joint, and I'm strictly not from characters like you two. Charles Lawton uh, was first signed to play the timid waiter uh, before he w had to bow out for some reason and was replaced by Henry Fonda. And, but he did tell Lucille Ball, Honey, if you're going to play a bitch, play it big. Enough with the talk, Pinks. Get me out of here. Tell those movies to scatter. She gets amazing reviews for The Big Street. But her friend, Charles Conner, who just became the head of RKO Studios, said, Lucy, uh, there's no advancement for you at RKO. Uh, you should really go to another studio. So she got out of her contract and went to MGM, the Rolls Royce of Hollywood. She dyes her hair red for her first film at MGM, Du Barry Was a Lady. It's a really fun musical comedy uh, with Red Skelton and Gene Kelly. And that Swami over there is Zero Mostel in one of his first roles. Lucille Ball loved working with Red Skelton, and she learned so much about comic timing from him. Uh, she would say that Red Skelton was as crazy off-camera as he is on-camera. Uh, during about the time uh, they were making Du Barry Was a Lady, Red Skelton was uh, buying a house in Palm Springs. So he visits with a realtor just wearing swim trunks. He pulls the down payment from the swim trunks. One of the people Lucille Bull got to know on the set was uh, comedian Buster Keaton and his longtime director Edward Sedgwick. Now it's the mid-1940s and Keaton's star has truly fallen at this period. He was one of the top comedians in the silent era, along with Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd. And when Keaton, Lucy, and Edward Sedgwick would hang out at a commissary and discuss comedy, people would go by very smugly and say, ah, oh, there's the three has-beens. Here's Buster Keaton in his 1928 film, The Cameraman, uh, directed by Edward Sedgwick. Now, if you're going to learn comedy, learn it from somebody like Keaton. Now here's a film that probably most Lucille Ball fans don't even know about. 1947's uh, noir classic, Lourdes. It's a thriller directed by Douglas Sirk. And it's about the search for like a Jack the Ripper killer in old London. And Lucille Ball plays this model who the police use to bait the su their number one suspect, who's played by Boris Karloff. And that must have been a great set. Boris Karloff and Lucille Ball working together. Talk about Lucille Ball being in a radio series where there's this vice president of a bank and he has this very ditzy, 
crazy wife, much like Lucy Ricardo, and they want to cast Richard Denning as the uh, as the husband, and she wants her husband, her real life husband, Desi Arnaz. So there's some opposition to saying, well, that's a mixed marriage, a Cuban and an American girl. So somehow this edged its way to television. They're putting together this story about a successful Cuban musician, Ricky Ricardo, played by Desi Arnaz, and his sort of crazy, ditzy wife, Lucy. And they're going to cast also the neighbors. This rare 1927 early sound short, The Ventriloquist, features vaudevillian William Frawley. Get this now, will you? Get this! All right, I'll try and get it. Are you still running around with that red-headed gal? <laughs> She's married now. Answer the question. Hey, you're too smart for a dummy. I'll get rid of you right now. That's his real-life wife playing the dummy. She was a uh, contortionist. Lucy and Desi would take control of this upcoming TV series, I Love Lucy, with the agreement that they would take a lesser salary if they would have more creative control and more technical control over the uh, project. It was Desi Arnaz's idea to uh, make the floor of the studio uh, concrete so they could put the camera on rollers so it can move and not creak the wooden floors. It was Desi Arnaz's idea to record the audience reaction with a separate microphone. They would have this isolated laugh track and they could sell this to other sitcoms. Up until mid-1970s, if you heard a laugh track, very often it's from I Love Lucy. The main technical aspect of I Love Lucy was that it was not a kinetoscope. A kinetoscope is where they take a television camera and they film a television screen of a telecast. And of course, when you do this, the um, picture quality becomes very, very muddled. And Lucille Ball gets the cinematographer from DuBarry Was a Lady, Carl Frund, to be their cinematographer. The show is a tremendous, tremendous hit. When it's on every week, all the restaurants, bars just empty out because everybody's at home watching I Love Lucy. Here she is with Fred and Ethel. They go to the Brown Derby restaurant in Hollywood, which is famous for celebrity appearances. And who sits next to them but William Holden. In another episode, she sneaks into Richard Widmark's house as he's entertaining the husband, Desi. Now, it's interesting that Richard Widmark was really against hunting. So, he was a good sport to have his make-believe persona be an avid hunter. Ricky, I've been meaning to ask you uh, these stories I've been hearing about your wife. Are they true? At about this time, they had the Hollywood witch hunt, where uh, Washington was trying to sniff out who's a communist in Hollywood. And some of them found out that Lucille Ball's grandfather was holding all these sort of communist meetings in the garage back in the 1930s. So they were uh, checking up on Lucille Ball. They had a big file on her. And it was Desi that said, the only thing read about my wife is her hair. The top is inside the trunk, sir. Oh, you mean a steel top? Exactly, a steel top. Why don't you uh, get in and raise the top yourself? Yeah, I, uh, I'll do it, dear. You just stand and watch. Honey, I'm the man in the family. Let me do it. You don't have to be a man to do it. Anyone can do it. <laughs> Lucy, honey, look, you know how to take ice cubes out of a refrigerator, but it's an automobile. It's a complicated machinery. Women just don't understand it. Hey, Lucy, put on the brakes. The trunk is open. Just be calm, dear. It's all right, sir. You see, it's all automatic. When you press the roof control, the rear deck lid sweeps up. The roof rises out of the trunk, swings up. Watch it now. And 
Finally, set screws automatically lock the roof to the windshield. There. From an open convertible with room inside for a weekend's worth of luggage to a hard top, all in a matter of seconds. Women, you know, all they think about is what a car looks like. How about how it goes? I know it goes. Yeah, yeah, but you ever stop to think what makes it go? Certainly. It has a thingamajig under the hood. <laughs> it's not a jigamajig. It's an interceptor V8 engine with precision fuel induction. If you are a Lucille Ball fan, I hope you learned some new stuff. And if you're not really too familiar with Lucille Ball, do check out her work. She's just one of the great women of comedy. I'm Glenn Andreev. Have a great day.